Welcome back to another episode on DIY Creators. I'm Glenn, and today I'm gonna to show you how you can make your very own multi-purpose workbench. I'll show you how to turn your circular saw into a table saw. I'll show you how to turn your jigsaw into a bandsaw. And I'll show you how to take your trim router and attach it to a customizable insert. And as time goes on, you can always upgrade these insert to best fit your need. And I'll show you how to add a downdraft to your workspace so you can collect all that dust from the sanding you'll be doing on top of this workbench. If you live in a place with limited space, a townhouse, an apartment, a place without a garage, find a place in your house that you can store this and when you need to use it, you pull it out. And when that day comes that I decide to stop building on this workbench, then the limitation is all up to you. A simple design with maximum flexibility. I'll show you step by step how you can make this for yourself. I'll show you how to add a custom power cord that's connected to your workbench. I'll also show you how to add dust collection and I'll show you how to wire an outlet that's controlled by a switch. If you're excited, I'm excited. Let's do it. I'm gonna start by cutting the top first. I place a piece of scrap wood right below the location which I plan to cut. And this should help support the wood after it's cut. I'm gonna use this circular saw jig which I made in a previous build. After the jig is clamped in place, I can then take the circular saw and make the first cut. And this is just a smaller version of the same jig that I just used, which I used to cut the wood down to the right size. Now I'm going to cut the sides followed by the back. I find it very easy to hold the two sides together as I measure from the end of the top to the two sides and that should give me the distance between the middle. Now take that measurement and make the cut for the back. Now I'm going to cut the trim going around the perimeter of the top. I label this piece is 2 inch by 2 inch but the actual size is 1.5 by 1.5. It could be a bit challenging to cut a piece of wood like this at a 45 degree angle but using a speed square should definitely help you get the job done. And now I'm cutting the inner panels for the workstation. I almost forgot about this crosscut jig which is very useful for this kind of application and this is also part of this video series as well. I did give this jig a name, it's called the Max Cut 2. It's pretty versatile and it definitely has some promise. At this point I've cut the top, the back, the two sides and also the inner panels and now I'm going to work on the inserts. With the stop block set it let me make repeatable cuts. And if you haven't seen this jig or you haven't gotten around to making it, you can always use the jig that I used early on in the videos to make all these cuts. Now that the insert width has been cut, it's time to cut the length of it down to the desired size. I determine the size of the insert by the largest tool, and in this case, it's my circular saw. So here's the application where this circular saw jig shines, and when you need to cut a small thin piece of wood, this jig lets you safely make that cut. Now after the piece of wood is lined up, I take a scrap piece of wood, hold down the work piece, and then I make a pass through. This piece of wood will be going around the opening for the insert, and this is what will support the insert. After making all the remaining cuts, it's time to start assembling the workbench. Majority of the joints in this build will be made with pocket holes, and I start by putting pocket holes in the two side panels first. Now using pocket holes give it a cleaner look, and if you don't have a pocket hole jig, or you don't mind seeing the screws, then you can always go that route. I'm going to start the assembly process by placing the top down on the flat surface and then attaching the two sides followed by the back. While attaching the sides you want to make sure you keep the sides and the top flush with each other so when you go to put the trim on there will be no gaps. The back and the two sides are on and now it's time to start installing the trim. Now even though I didn't use a ton of wood glue in this build, I will suggest that you use wood glue for all your joints. Now being that I didn't have enough large clamps, I started by clamping the two sides on first and then screwed them from the inside then moved the clamps to the front and the back. After screwing the back trim on, it's time to move my focus to the front. Attaching the front is a bit different from the way I just did the sides and the only thing that I can think of at that moment was using pocket holes. Now attach the trim and be sure to keep the top and the trim flush with each other. Next I'm going to add the inside panels which will support the shelves and I'm going to use pocket holes as well to join these pieces. 
Now I made the shelves from half inch plywood which I used to keep the weight down but you can totally use the same 3 quarter inch plywood for the shelves as well. So the next piece to add is the front panel and I made that a tight fit and then I also attached that using pocket hole screws as well. I started from the front panel then I worked my way to the back. And before attaching the inner panels I checked the squaring and then I also checked the spacing between the two panels. Now when it came to the shelves I lined it up so that the bottom was even to the front panel and in my case I did that for aesthetic reason but in your case you may want to adjust these based on your needs. So if you notice I pre-drilled then installed the screws to prevent the wood from splitting and then used a combination square to set the depth going all the way around. So now I'm going to start with the first insert and the first insert I'm going to make is the one for the circular saw. I did make a few reference mark, one for the blade and one for the side of the base. The saw will be upside down and the blade should be facing forward. To line up the insert I'm going to rely on a framing square which needs to be squared with the front of the workbench. Then I'll trace the perimeter of the insert. Now I drilled out a few holes to pass the jigsaw blade through and in this case I used four holes one in each corner and that will be my starting point for the jigsaw. And while cutting the goal is to stay as close to the line as possible. The closer you are to the line the tighter the insert would be. Now the goal here is to go slow let the jigsaw do the work all you have to do is just control the jigsaw and don't let it get away from you. Although a straight line would look nice in this case you do not have to be perfect. As long as the insert fit and it's easy to take it in and out then that should be fine. Now although I'd like it to be the main focus of the tool is to not be squared up with the insert but squared up with the front edge of the workbench. These strips of wood will support the insert from the inside. Now clamp the strips of wood along the perimeter of the opening and then screw them from underneath. And if all goes well, your insert should fit in just fine. And now I'm going to add two holes on the front and two holes in the back to hold the insert in place. So it turns out I didn't make the insert big enough for the circular saw. Now the width of it was just fine. It was just the measurement from the front to the back, which means I had to open up the hole a little more. And I also had to remake the inserts. I used a framing square to help me line up the holes on the insert. So I needed a way to keep the bit straight while I was drilling. I used two pieces of scrap wood, screwed those together and that helped a ton. And now that the hole is drilled I need to make sure when I install the screw that it's flush with the top of the wood. So I use a countersink bit or you can use a larger drill bit to help you with this process. So there's a couple ways you can duplicate the holes in your insert. One, you can use the main one as a template and you can also put a new insert inside the table and then drill from underneath. So at this point I remade the insert and now it's time to make the first one for the circular saw. So before cutting into the insert just make sure the body of the saw does clear everything while going down into the insert. Since this part needs to be accurate we need to make sure that the blade is perpendicular to the front edge of the bench. And I'll accomplish that by using a framing square. So as shown in the video I'm going to use two pieces of material with straight edge and this should act as a guide to help me control the circular saw. If you notice the back of the saw is facing the front of the workbench. Now the reason for this is once the saw is flipped upside down this is where the blade is going to be. Now before making the cut if you notice I do have the blade guard clamped out of the way so that I can see what I'm doing. I made the blade slot approximately two inches longer than it should be and doing so should give you clearance when you mount the saw from underneath. In earlier videos I did made some holes inside my saw which I'm planning to utilize in this case so you may have to drill new holes in your saw base. Now I'm going to drill out the marks I made and to secure the saw to this I'm going to use some 632nd T-nuts. Now the T-nuts need to be below the surface and this way I can slide wood across without them interfering. Now install the saw and secure it in place. So the circular saw part is pretty much done at this point. Now I need to drill out a grab hole so that I can pull this insert back out. 
So at this point, I'm going to install the T-nuts to secure the insert in place. And there's a few ways you can install this. I'm going to use a C-clamp, but you can always use a bolt and washer to tighten it up, which will pull the T-nut inside the wood. And now I'm on to the next insert, which is the jigsaw. And we may have a different jigsaw, so we may have to use a different method to attach them. So at first I was going to drill a one inch hole and then I thought about it. Majority of the blades is small enough to fit inside a three quarter hole. I drilled a grab hole in this insert as well. To attach the jigsaw to the insert, I'm going to utilize the existing holes that was in the front of the saw and these were tapped. As far as the back, I'm going to utilize this open area, which I'm going to use a nut and bolt. And here you can see I drilled the holes to pass the bolts through. Since I do have some movement before tightening the bolts, I'm going to use a square to square up the jigsaw the best I could and then tighten it down. So the next insert to tackle will be the router. Now being that this is a trim router, you will have some limitation if you're comparing it to a table router. For example, to make any fine tune adjustment, you won't be able to do it from the top. You would have to take out the insert and then make your adjustment and put the insert back. Overall, I think it's a great setup for beginners and DIYers that like to do it themselves. Now to get started, I drilled a pilot hole from the top, flipped the insert upside down, then I traced out a box going around the router itself and I made that about one inch bigger, half inch on each side. To route this section out, I'm using a straight bit, which I lowered about an eighth of an inch then I followed the guideline going around. Making a first pass through is okay, but I will need to go lower eventually and I won't have the support on both sides so I need to make a jig even though it's going to be a throwaway jig. The purpose of this jig is to help me get a consistent route and to make a quick jig I'm going to take a few pieces of thin plywood, screw those together and then I'm going to set the router on top of the two plywood. Then take two scrap pieces of wood and place it on the outside of the router to help hold the router in place. So now with this jig I can make fine tune adjustment by lowering the bit as I make a pass through and that should give me one consistent flat surface which means the base of the router will sit flat and I'll be able to raise the router bit even higher. And now I'm going to use the base of the router as a template to mark the mounting holes then drill the holes out. I used a one inch bit to drill out the center which was the pilot hole that I previously drilled. So now I'm going to take a large drill bit to drill out the holes just enough to get the screw head to sink below the surface of the wood. And next on the list I have the downdraft insert which a lot of you guys told me I could also use this for vacuum forming. Next, I made a border going around the insert and then I marked from one side to the other, keeping all the lines one inches apart. The next set of line is also spaced one inches apart and going perpendicular from the first line and the end results on this should look something like a grid. Next, I'm going to drill a small hole where each line intersects. Now drilling all these holes were a decent amount of work but however at the end result it does look awesome and the back did suffer from some blowout which I'll clean that up using a sander. If doing electrical work is not your thing I may have an option that would possibly work for you. You'll need a one foot cord and you also need a switched outlet which I'll have links for these items down in the description. And the way this will work you'll put the extension cord inside the dust container and the small piece of wood represent the bottom of the dust container. Then you'll notch out a section for the cord to pass through and then screw the bottom on. And inside the box you'll plug in your power tool and then you'll plug the switch outlet into an extension cord. And you'll want to place this toward the front of the saw so it's easy to turn it on and off. And now I'll show you a more permanent option. To install the power switch I'm going to use a single gain plastic junction box which I'm going to trace this out and then use the jigsaw to cut out the hole. I did receive a few comments stating that this may be a safety issue being that it's in the front and it can be easily bumped. So my thoughts on that is 
if you're extremely concerned about the position of the switch then you can always relocate it to a location where you think it's safe and one thing to keep in mind the switch i'm using is just a regular light switch that control a light in your house so if you feel there's a better option for you then by all means go with that option i did want it this installation be as efficient as possible that's why i mounted the switch and the outlet back to back to wire up the electrical, I'm gonna use a cable for a 15 amp circuit. In this case, I'm gonna be using a 14 gauge wire and the outlet and the switch also need to be rated for 15 amps. Now, the reason for that is most circular saw that I've seen have all been rated for 15 amps. So you may wanna double check yours to make sure that it does meet the requirement. So for this setup, I'm gonna be using this light switch to control the outlet. Now, if you notice, you have two gold plated screws here and in electrical world, that's typical mean that you're hot leg. So in this case, I have the hot leg going in one terminal and then it's coming out the other. And it doesn't matter which one you put it on because if you put it in either one, it's gonna come out the other. So the jumper that I just attached, that's going to the outlet itself. Next, we need to add a ground wire and in the electrical world, a green terminal always mean it's a ground. And that's it for the switch. So now just push everything in the junction box and close this one up. On one side of the receptacle, you have a set of gold screws. And then the other side of the receptacle, you have a set of silver screws. And then you always have your ground. First, I'm gonna terminate the black wire, which terminates on the gold screws. And that will be your hot. And then I'm gonna terminate the white wire, which actually look yellow. And that is your neutral. And the final termination on the receptacle is the ground wire. So I'm gonna terminate that to the green screw. Now the next thing I'm gonna do is tie all the grounds together, the one from the switch, the one from the receptacle, and the one from the cable. Now after twisting all the wires together, now tighten it with a wire nut. To mount the switch and the receptacle back to back, I needed to add some spacers between the two. Now one thing I wanted to address here is that you can find a single port receptacle for this hookup here. In my case, I'm using the items that I had so I can give you guys an idea on how this hookup works. Now to strap the electrical cable up and out of the way, I'm going to use some cable staples and that should hold it in place. Next, drill a hole big enough for the cable to pass through. And since this is a custom piece, I would say you may want to consider making the cable as long as you want so that you don't need an extension cord to use it. Now I'm going to strip the cable to add the male connector on the end of the wire. Now it just dawned on me that you could use a 15 amp extension cord, just remove the female end and wire that to your switch and the receptacle and that should leave you with the male end on one side. Now to terminate this connector, it's going to be the same concept. The green wire is going to go to the green terminal, the black wire is going to go to the gold terminal and the white wire is going to go to the silver terminal. So you could just plug any device in and test the outlet to make sure that it does work and operate the way it should. Now chances are we're going to have a different setup for our dust port. I'm using a rigid hose and it came with this adapter. To make this work I'm going to have to cut off this lip so that the adapter can fit in the round hole. And now I'm going to take the focus back to working on the workbench. I'm going to attach these strips of wood here which will support the bottom of the dust container. After attaching the two sides it's then time to attach the back. Now attach the bottom and secure it with screws. Add the bottom and secure that with screws. Now I'm going to take the adapter and trace it out from the inside so I know exactly where to drill it. Make a hole in the center of that and drill out. Now trace the adapter on the work surface. Now I'm going to cut this out with a jigsaw and I did make this look a little more dramatic than it should have been. What I should have done here was drill a second hole close to the line and that way I could have made a pass through going all the way around. Now in hindsight I should have cut this pipe first and that way I would have made sure that it had the tight fit and I wouldn't have to use epoxy to hold it in place. Now to soften the edge of the workbench I'm going to use a round over bit to go around the perimeter of the workbench. You could also use a palm sander to soften the edge as well. Now add wood filler to fill in any cracks between the top and the trim. And once that's dry, sand down the entire workbench and also the inserts.
Now it really doesn't matter on the way you plan to finish this whether you do the top or the bottom first. In my case I chose to do the bottom first and work my way to the top. The paint I'm using here is a white high gloss latex paint. I put two coats of that on the body because I did not want to see the raw wood look. The plan is to use this opening for all the inserts and I painted it a dark color with the hope that this would hide all the future dings and dents. Now personally I'm not a fan of the raw wood look and to my understanding Danish oil sit inside the wood not on the surface so you can slide your wood back and forth without any friction. Now to apply the Danish oil it's pretty simple just follow the instruction on the container and per the instruction flood the surface and let it sit for about 30 minutes so it can soak. And at that point you can gradually add another coat until you get to the desired color. Now do the same thing to your insert as well. I only applied the one coat and after 30 minutes I then wiped it off with a clean rag. And since I use my brush, I use paint thinner to clean the brush. And yes, that was a lot of work, but it was so satisfying to be able to put this plate on because it meant that I was done. And to hide the screw heads, I use screw caps to give it a cleaner look. And I'll give you a quick 360 of the finished product. Keep in mind that I have a fence to add to this in future videos. We have the miter slot, we have the bottom part, we have more inserts, we have a ton to add to this workbench. So all in all, this is just the beginning. So I have a couple of issues I want to address because of the outlet I used. There was some concern from the first video I posted of this. And one of the concern was dust would be getting into the outlet and it could be a fire hazard. And in this case, I say you can use a weatherproof case like this. Just put on the right insert. It comes with multiple insert. Now you can just knock out the bottom so your cord can pass through. And I think that would be a quick fix or you can make a wooden cover. The positive to using a double outlet is you can control your shop vac as well when you turn on the power tools. And another issue to address is adding a raven knife so the wood don't bind up on the blade and cause kickback. So the challenge behind this one is finding a solution that everybody can duplicate. And I'll give you a quick visual of exactly what I'm going for. On my table saw I have a raven knife and it's perfectly lined up with the blade and that's what we're going to be going for. So I did plan to address the blade tilting in this video, but I ran out of time and I wasn't able to do it. So I'll have to address that in a future video. And the key is to just open up the slot wide enough so that the blade can tilt. I'd like to say thank you guys for watching this video. I do have a set of plans down in the video description. So I hope you guys enjoyed this one. And if you did, be sure to hit that thumbs up and let me know what your thoughts are down in the comments. Now, as far as the name on the table, I have not settled on a name yet. You guys gave me some great options and I still have to narrow that list down. I'm hoping to do that pretty soon. My schedule been pretty brutal so I'm a little behind with a few things and I'm trying to play catch up. And that's it guys. So be sure to check me out on social medias. All my links are on the screen. Catch me on Facebook, Twitter and you also catch me on Instagram. So I will catch you guys later. Enjoy.